George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Boris Johnson is no more. How long have I waited to say that? But what legacy has he left? And will the trust provide any support for the millions of British people facing energy catastrophe? Never mind fuel poverty. This is fuel catastrophe looming in just a few weeks' time in a long, cold, but politically hot British winter. And Mrs. Zelensky says that we in Britain are counting pennies while the Ukrainians are counting casualties. But we don't owe you anything, Mrs. Zelensky. Your husband's government has brought all this catastrophe down upon themselves, but upon the rest of us also. The government in the Czech Republic will be the next to fall as a hundred thousand people gather in Prague and demand the resignation of the government by the 25th of this month. And the war drags on, although I suspect not with the same intensity in the months to come as the months behind us for reasons I shall explain. We will be touring the horizon looking at the economic, military, strategic and political issues of the day, starting with Boris Johnson, who's really, really gone, I promise you. I'm looking at my watch. I can see him and his removal van disappearing out of Downing Street for the last time. Or will he make a comeback sometime? Maybe you can let me know what you think on that. The big freeze is upon us. Will the lights go out also? Will there be blackouts to accompany the freezing conditions? We've got a poll running on that right now. And it doesn't look good for the trust. I've got to tell, I can't resist these medical analogies over Liz Truss. You'll have to forgive me. Fasten your truck, your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy ride because this is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. He's gone, Billy Bunter. A cross between Billy Bunter and Flashman has gone, departed the British political scene. May not even see out the rest of this parliament. May sit like Edward Heath used to sit, right opposite me, with really big swollen ankles in a permanent sulk. Or he'll take off to the United States, the lecture circuit, books and columns, and become a multi-millionaire. Might be able to repay some of those loans that some of those plutocrats grave him for the furnishings, for the decoration of Downing Street and to pull him out of a hole or two. He was a bounder, a cad, should have been horsewhipped out of public life actually before he even got in it, repeatedly sacked and denounced by his employers one after the other as a persistent and actually pathological liar, a man who couldn't get any story straight, a man you wouldn't leave with your children, certainly wouldn't leave with your wife, is now out of British politics. He's finished, dead, a dodo, a dead parrot, or is he? There are still true believers, I know they are frequently in touch with me. There are people who believe he'll go away to a Colombe, les dos Anglais, and wait for a grateful nation to welcome his return. But I don't think so, because Boris Johnson spends way above his means. 
and that is one of the things that has done for him. His dodgy holidays, his undeclared interests, trips and all the rest, all contributed to a picture of Boris Johnson as a man not to be trusted. Not to be trusted with his own family, by his own family, not to be trusted in any relations he had with your family, a cad of the First Order, a Victorian Order cad. He didn't have a waxed moustache to twirl, but he might as well have done. Boris Johnson's legacy is miserable. It is Britain headed in to a cold, poverty-stricken, probably unemployed and definitely desperate winter. That's his main legacy for me. Of course, he got Brexit done. The Brexit that we voted for, the Brexit we were looking forward to, but the Brexit with which he's done nothing. He'll be remembered particularly for the Ukraine war because no leader in the Western world, and I include sleepy Joe Biden in this, has done more to perpetuate the senseless slaughter in Ukraine and the collateral damage of economic collapse throughout Europe and Britain than Boris Johnson. It is reported, I don't know myself the facts, but I think it has the ring of truth that when Zelensky and the Russian side were close to a potential peace agreement, Boris Johnson on one of his multiple trips to Kiev, he was to be found more often in Kiev than anywhere else, certainly anywhere else in his own country he was supposed to be governing, he scuppered that potential peace deal. He forced, at least pushed, Zelensky into fighting on. It will all come right on the night, he said. One more push, more weapons, more money, more propaganda, lie machine support, and you can recover the territory that you have lost to the advancing Russian armed forces. Even, he encouraged him to say and believe, you can recover Crimea, which has been a part of Russia since before the United States of America existed as a country and has been the base of the Russian Navy for 300 years and more. Boris Johnson, it is said, also told our special forces and intelligence services to train a commando of 65 irregulars to make a landing at the beleaguered, besieged nuclear power plant when the IAEA nuclear inspectors were inside it to capture it and hold the inspectors hostage. The Russians claim that the 65 commandos, some of whom have been captured alive, had all been trained in Britain for this operation. Again, I don't know that. I'm not privy to anybody's military secrets, but it has the ring of truth. It is exactly the kind of audacious, although ultimately fatal, escapade that someone like Boris Johnson would encourage. It would have scandalized the world for sure, but it would have meant that a nuclear power plant, which posed an existential threat to the whole of the European continent, could be a hostage game changer in the war. And if it went wrong as it did, well, only a few will have fallen. 62 to be precise, three have been captured alive. If those three testify that Boris Johnson and the British government, British special forces, and the British intelligence services, then there will be very serious questions to answer. Not just about Johnson, he'll be gone and racking up his new millions. 
but about an intelligence service which is already potentially in fatal disgrace. The Sunday Times and the BBC having revealed at the weekend that the British intelligence services agreed to cover up the fact that Canadian intelligence, five eyes, five eyes, can you see it? The Canadian intelligence services smuggled not just Shamima Begum, but potentially every single one of the Asian youth who left Britain to go and fight, many of them to die, many of them to kill and torture with ISIS in Syria. It might have been an entirely Canadian affair. The Canadian intelligence services came to London in 2015, seven years ago, and told the commander of the anti-terrorism unit at Scotland Yard, whose officers had been scouring the globe for Shamima Begum, that she was indeed in Syria and that one of their intelligence agents had smuggled her over the border, having taken pictures of her passport and handed everything over to the Canadian Embassy in Jordan. And the British intelligence services agreed to cover the whole matter up, thereby misleading two years ago in June the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, which considered the appeal by the United Kingdom government against the return of Shamima Begum to Britain to contest the UK government's decision to remove her citizenship, withdraw her passport and render her stateless in a prison camp in northern Syria. If the intelligence services did not appraise the learned judges of the Supreme Court of the facts I have just imparted to you, then they are guilty at least of obstruction of justice, of contempt of court, and possibly of criminal conspiracy to cover up the activities of terrorist groups and their patrons. It doesn't get much more serious than that unless we are able to add into the mix a plot to kidnap the International Atomic Energy Association officials visiting the ZZP nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Well, there's so much to talk about, I better get on to the big enchilada. I have been preaching for decades, decades, since the 1970s about the critical importance for my own country and by extension to other countries of energy self-sufficiency and public ownership and control. I did it for the first time when the late and great Mr. Ben set up the British National Oil Corporation when Britain's oil resources, Bonanza, was just starting to come ashore at the very time the oil prices had quadrupled as a result of the Arab-Israeli war in 1973. I continued to do so as an honorary member of the National Union of Mine Workers throughout the 1980s when Margaret Thatcher was burying our thousand years of coal on which we as an island sit and stand, when we murdered the mining communities, when we destroyed the mine workers union for political malice and spite, and then flooded our own coal mines, which if we had not flooded, we would now be quickly putting back into production. I did it in the 1990s, when we began again reinvading the Middle East 
to seize control of oil and gas resources which God made the mistake of putting under other people's countries. And even those that were with me up until this point, I'm about to lose some of you. I did it throughout the noughties and beyond when we began to fall for fadery, when we began to fool for fadery, when we began to imagine you could fuel a still important manufacturing and industrial power of 68 million people with windmills and solar panels and whatever other wheezes the renewable industries have come up with. We over-invested in the fads and we under-invested in the production of real power. We ran down under Blair and Brown the world lead that we had in the production of nuclear energy and we continued to murder the last remaining dregs of our coal mining industry even though we had clean coal technology carbon capture mechanisms that would have taken all but five percent of harmful particles out of the coal which we had in such profusion i spoke out for 50 years on this issue but they didn't listen and now despite the fact that Britain is surrounded by an oceanic volume of our own country's oil and gas, despite the fact that we still have hundreds of years of coal accessible at a price, if we resurrect our mining industry, we are going into this winter facing economic catastrophe. Cafes, bars, restaurants, factories, warehouses, employers of all kinds are already now reporting power, energy bills that are not just to complain about, they are bills that are literally unpayable. People's electricity and gas bills are going from hundreds to thousands. Some are going from thousands to tens of thousands and it's still the beginning of September. If it's a long cold winter we are done for. We will have millions of people unemployed. We will have millions of people refusing to pay their energy bills because they cannot pay them. We will have millions of people deciding whether to eat or heat, whether to feed their children or keep their children warm. Something has got to give. The German government, little Corporal Schultz, has just announced a 63 billion euro packet to try and rescue the German economy from the coming Armageddon. The trust will not say what she's going to do except she will not be doing anything on the price cap. The market will rule, but the market is rigged. People who own energy companies in Britain are charging their own people in France a fraction of what they are planning to charge us, foreign companies, even foreign governments, have got us by the balls. And the British government doesn't have the balls, even in a trust, to do anything about it. So the people will have to rise up themselves and show, as the people in Prague did in the last 24, 48 hours, that up with this we will not put. We have to move the politicians into rescuing our people 
and rescuing our economy before it is too late. This pattern that I have just described will be replicated throughout Europe, which is being sacrificed by the United States, which will have many of these problems itself, by the way, but the U.S. are ready to fight not just to the last drop of Ukrainian blood against Russia. They are ready to fight to the last European. You can shiver. You can starve. But as Mrs. Zelensky said in scolding you on British state TV this morning, you're counting pennies. They're counting casualties in a war that never had to be, in a war that they themselves brought on. Crucially, at the behest of, with the encouragement of, and with the wherewithal of, the United States, the European Union, and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Fasten your seatbelts. I told you it was going to be a bumpy ride. From the makers of Track and Trace comes the Boris Johnson sat-nav. Right, uh, next right. Uh, no, left. Uh, I, I mean left. Uh, what? Yes, uh, yes, no, this left. Oh, cracky, you've missed it, bugger. Um, no bloody Tories. Or, or have you? Uh, uh, turn around. Or, in fact, don't turn around. Carry on. Yes. You have arrived at your destination. If you want to respond to any of that or raise any other point, here are the numbers in the US and Canada. It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four, and it is absolutely free. Not often you can say that in the United States. In the UK and Ireland, it's o eight o eight one nine six double five double two. Also completely free. But if you are having no, uh, difficulty calling those numbers from other countries abroad, try this new local London number. 0044-203-966-2625. The number is on the ticker right now. I'm uh, going to take next my next guest, I think, who is a real likely lad. He's a compatriot of mine. Indeed, comes from not 20 miles from where I was born and grew up. He's become a social media personality of the first rank with a gigantic following. You must follow him. His views are not my views. My views are not his views. But both of our views are always worth hearing. So listen up now for James Melville. James, uh, welcome to the show. It's Evening, always George. a pleasure uh, to see you. Let me uh, start by asking for your reflections on the man in that removal van uh, currently backing out of Downing Street. Um, good riddance to bad rubbish. I mean, I've said this for a long time, that he's the ultimate charlatan. The only thing he's fit for purpose for is winning elections, which says more about the country itself than maybe him. Um, but he was there by design to get Brexit done in whatever shape or form. Um, there's no doubting his election successes, but there's a lot of doubt over his integrity. Um, and I think sometimes someone's greatest strength and greatest weakness can be both their strength and failing within politics as well. And I think that's his ability to, to charm, but to the point of deception. And I think that's what his undoing would have been in the end. And it's even happening this week, where in his last demob happy week, he's talking about buying a new kettle at an expense of £20 that can suddenly solve an energy crisis. Um, so, yes, he's the, he'll go down in history as someone who had an ability to charm and cajole and win elections. But in terms of his legacy, it's, uh, it's basically tumbleweed. There hasn't been much achieved. And he's leaving the country in a much worse state than when he arrived, in particular one of the worst cost of living crises 
not just in this generation, but many generations. And that's largely because of the important things, serving the people and looking after the people, he's been asleep at the wheel. And the Tory party generally have been asleep at the wheel for weeks, conducting a leadership contest that's like the worst elements of The Apprentice. And meanwhile, Britain are watching their energy fees go up, not just in households, but also businesses as well. And the businesses don't have the cap. And now we're going into the autumn and still nothing has been achieved. Johnson's given the impression, even though he was ousted, he gave off the impression he was demob happy, putting his trotters up on various beaches around the Mediterranean, rather than at least trying to do the job that he was still paid for, and that's be prime minister. So I think to summarise all of that and that slight rant about Boris Johnson, I'm no fan. Um, I think it's good that he's gone, but I think the alternatives aren't really going to give us much relief. What we need is actually politicians who are doing what we pay them to do, and that is serve our people to make sure that they've got legacy investment in public services and infrastructures, and to make sure that we do not create perfect storms when there's a crisis. The energy crisis is a perfect example of that, whereby for generations, governments have failed to put an energy strategy in place, have not used all of our natural assets in this, this island to good effect, a reliance on foreign, policy, foreign, foreign energy, and also combined with basically a short-term economic strategy to try and provide solutions for not just households, but also businesses as well. So we've got a perfect storm of circumstances. And as part of Johnson's legacy, he's been asleep at the wheel over what is a mounting um, energy crisis over the next few months. Well, there may be a PS, uh, James, uh, written on lavender notepaper. Uh, I was around, as you were not, for Harold Wilson's resignation honours. Wait till you see Boris Johnson's resignation honours is all I'll say to you on that. Uh, you made the point that the alternatives are grim, and that's certainly true in the uh, grimace of uh, Sir Keir Starmer, but what about the mini, uh, I call her midget Maggie, uh, Liz Truss, who will be along in a minute? Are you expecting anything from her? I mean, the only reason she's going to win this is because Sunak's conducted one of the worst leadership campaigns on record. He's literally gone against his base. I think basically saying there should be more um, taxation and not doing anything about national insurance that he himself raised and effectively creating more cost of living problems on a cost of living crisis is the reason he's not going to win. It's been a terrible campaign. So Liz Truss, I think, has got lucky. She's seen, the sort of lesser, she's seen as the lesser of all evils. But based on our presentation style, her track record in government, her ability to get under the skin of a brief and come up with solutions that are legacy solutions, not just rhetoric and sound bites, I have no faith. But, you know, I don't want to be judgmental before she started, but maybe ye of little faith. Well, uh, she'll, she's, she was not Rishi Sunak, which was her best asset. Uh, maybe in parenthesis, she had a white face, uh, which up against uh, a black man in, uh, in a conservative party, uh, largely still populated, 150,000 of them, by uh, golf club bores, gin and jag bigots, uh, helped her too. And she'll be helped by the fact she's not Keir Starmer. Yeah, I mean, I think... I mean, look, I mean, this is it's a terrible lesson of all evils. We're at a situation, maybe I'm just sounding old here, George, but I think it seems to be law diminishing returns with our politicians. I mean, looking back in the day, going back to the 80s, 90s, whether you agreed with what was then the left versus right ideological divide, I don't think it is that anymore. It's something very different. It's, it's, it's more about authoritarianism versus a form of liberalism and libertarianism. But that's a separate debate. I think the cycle of politicians is diminishing. We seem to have machine politicians now who are in it for, to feather their own nests, but they don't have an ideological vision. Energy policy is a perfect example of that because, you know, if you compare the UK even to the French, the French have got the biggest kind of nuclear supplies. The UK have got under 15%. We, we don't, we've, we don't for, for instance, have a conversation about other forms of energy, how it's all in the mix. We're reliant on overseas um, supply. And we're leaving ourselves wide open to the current crisis where basically um, corporate spivs are charging through the roof. We're going to put businesses and households 
under the line. This is all, but, but fundamentally, the reason for all of that is because of our politicians who are failing us because they're not getting on top with, of, of the brief with long-term solutions. This, this has been going on for far too long. We seem to have almost like a carnival of the grotesque, like some sort of game show or some sort of talent show of mediocrity within our top tier politics. And if we think that Liz Truss, Liz Truss is a solution, then we, we haven't got a solution, we've got a big problem. Yeah, uh, Britain's not got talent. There would be a game <laughs> show uh, on which they would all excel. Um, I know, by the way, uh, because if you, if you heard my monologue, I have been banging on about energy for 50 years of my life. And nobody even wanted to talk about energy. It was Boersville. Uh, the, the chamber would empty uh, when any uh, discussion on energy policy uh, came up. The coal mining industry was destroyed, not for... Uh, energy reasons or economic reasons, but for political reasons. Uh, what's going to happen now, James? You're a man with your finger on the pulse. Uh, I was one of the people that refused to pay my poll tax and thereby contributed in the end to the downfall of Margaret Thatcher. We must be headed into that territory now. The difference being, at a push, People could have paid their poll tax. It doesn't matter how hard they push, they won't be able to pay their gas and electricity bill. I think that's right. It's very different. If you look at some of the examples already starting with this, various owners of pubs saying they're going from bills of 50,000 to 450,000, that's, you can't, that's just a jump too far. It's, it's, it's an appalling jump. So you've got the two crises hand in hand. You've got households, we're suddenly looking at a jump from, say, 150 to 500 pounds. We're looking at business where it's multitudes of thousands. Now, I mean, I'm, I, I, I mean, I agree with you in terms of what's happened in terms of legacy with, um, with mining. It's not the knock-on effects we've talked about quite often. It's not just about creating a schism with our energy supply, but it's also been the hollowing out of communities, areas that you and I both grew, grew up in, the hollowing out of communities for 40 years since Britain became deindustrialized. Now, I recognize we've got to move with the times and get industries that are relevant to the times, but right now, the here and now times, we've got a double whammy of an energy supply crisis and an energy pricing crisis. And that's only, and those two things that are combined, what, what binds them together is that we don't have an effective energy strategy. And considering the assets around Britain, I find that utterly ludicrous and appalling. And it's excessive governments that have done that because they've been asleep at the wheel. And combined with the fact that because we don't have an energy strategy and we basically hollowed out our industries back in the 80s, we've got communities from Cornwall right up to Scotland which haven't regenerated. They've had 40 years of decline. That's part of the problem as well. And governments haven't got on top of that issue either. So in terms of our very found, and don't even start before we go on about education and the NHS, there's a multitude of problems there as well. Our very foundations of public services and infrastructures and industry have not been taken care of for, for 40 years at least. And the chickens are coming home to roost right now with this monumental energy crisis, pricing crisis, that is going to be way, way beyond anything that we've seen in terms of tragic human interest stories on the doorstep and in businesses. People will be un unable to pay, plus businesses will go under with the massively inflated costs. And meanwhile, we have a government that hasn't done anything through the leadership contest apart from just tokenism. Our parliament's been shut on recess in a national looming emergency. And we, meanwhile, what's coming down the tracks is increased prices as we go on towards the winter. And it seems to be the only strategy at the moment is cross our fingers and hope that it doesn't get too cold. That's not good enough. We pay our taxes, we expect better solutions from our leaders, and we haven't been getting effective solutions for a very long time. And now we're facing another crisis because of governments, not just this government, previous governments, have taken the eye off the ball. One of the essential aspects of the very pillars and foundations of a stable society, and that's energy supply and energy pricing. Well, the latest inflation prediction is 22%. Uh, it, it was 16% it was prediction the week before. Uh, now it's 22%. It might be 25. It might be 30. 
It might be runaway inflation. Uh, and of course, all these businesses that cannot pay their energy bills are going to throw more and more people onto the unemployment heap. May, and those people will then be as incapable as anyone of paying uh, gas and electricity prices at this uh, level. We've really got the makings of a crisis uh, here, James. And you and I are in agreement that the current crop of political leaders uh, are not up to the uh, up to the challenge. You know, we don't have solutions. That's the thing. You know, it's but it's also it does remind me a little bit of the poll tax. You touched on that earlier. I remember that. I know people power managed to basically nudge the government and was a Trojan horse to the the fall of Thatcher. But this is what we need for this. Is it's going to be something whereby it does get coordinated there has to be protesting there has to be aspects i think of non-compliance but that's only going to happen because it's a zero-sum game for people there's no choice people will just simply not be able to pay the level of bills that we're talking about here whether it's household or business and then the knock-on effects of that are more poverty more homelessness job losses supply chain effects because other businesses are affected because the source of business they're working on goes under as well we're heading for a perfect storm now we were warning about this energy crisis Months ago, inflation was going up. There was problems coming down the tracks from all different sources, whether it's to do with the war, whether it's to do with lockdowns, whether it's to do with the fact that basically Britain are sort of exposed in terms of not in complete control of their energy supply. These problems were already there. And inflation was creeping up, but the government didn't do anything about it. And it reminds me of it's the same thing as the NHS when the government are constantly saying through the pandemic, we've got to protect the NHS. But meanwhile, Bed numbers are going down. Investment in real terms going down as well. And the staff shortages. The government have had two cycles now of winters in the, in the NHS to sort it out, but they haven't. But it goes back even further than that. Every winter, there's stories about the NHS is in crisis again. Now we're getting the same stories about energy supply. The very foundations of what we expect as citizens in this country, they're not being fulfilled. So that you know, it poses the question, what exactly are we paying our taxes for? If our government isn't investing our money wisely, or we're not getting the caliber of politicians to come up with long-term strategy, where is the social contract right now if we're going to go into the winter with a potential NHS crisis, potentially a food shortage crisis, combined with an energy crisis? It's simply not good enough. James Mavol, you're a wise man. Thanks for sharing your wisdom uh, with us. Uh, now, uh, I've got uh, some super chats to read. Um, what's super chat? Super chat is the means by which you help the fighting fund to relaunch the midweek mother of all talk shows on Wednesday, the 12th of October. Instead of the Galloway show, which is just me and Gayatri, and is, by the way, getting more than a quarter of a million views per week. One camera, my wife and me, not even a dog. We don't have one, just a man and wife and a camera. It's getting a quarter of a million views, which shows there's a market for a midweek mother of all talk shows. We knew that when we had to close it for financial reasons, but we don't want to go off up on the 12th of October like a rocket only to fall down like a burnt stick. We need a fighting fund to ensure that the midweek show can continue until we manage to get a sponsor. And if you are watching and think you might be that sponsor, I can deliver you an audience of hundreds of thousands of people every week. So get in touch. But Super Chat is on YouTube, which is increasingly the best place to watch the mother of all talk shows, for algorithmic reasons, if you get my drift. Go, if you're on YouTube, to the Super Chat mechanism and make whatever donation you can. As Albert Sontag did this evening, as he does every single week, and he's donated 40 American dollars. And he says, I'm thinking of Cromwell before Naseby. Good luck in all your endeavors. Well, if I have any good luck, Albert, it's in part thanks to your support. Sailing Prepa gives five American dollars and says, 
I'll have to catch you on the replay. So here's my donation. Hope you enjoy it, brother. Dino Pantecaulas says, my weekly contribution to the Fighting Fund. Thank you, George, for fighting for the international working class. Greetings, as always, from New York. And Peter Moss says, uh, sends 10 pounds and says, regretfully, I pay a license fee to watch rubbish news. How can I not donate to someone who tells you the truth? God bless you, George. Russia is not our enemy. God bless you, Peter. Thank you. Jay Copario gives three pounds and says, will you interview Phil Bevin on your show? That is a very good idea. I'll see if we can get Phil on next week. Now, uh, after the break, I'm going to show you a teaser of a slightly longer piece I'm going to show later in the show. It's good, not just because it's prophetic, it's from, I think, six or even eight years ago, but it's important for now, right now. Let me take a break and then we'll go right into yours truly at the Oxford Union. Hello, America. It is me, Joe Biden. I think I'm not re 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 reading a tele -tet 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 prompter. I'm perfectly capable of speaking for myself. 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 The giant Labour Party sailing clearance is now on. Hurry now, as we've got zero interest in our party. It's literally the lowest it's ever been. Give up on the common man and save today. That's right, we're getting rid of all of the Corbynites. Literally every single one. Being a Blairite has never been more in style. Only available at what should be the UK's biggest political party. The new, new Labour Party. We're doing this again. Let's play a game and I'll ask you yes or no questions. Ready? Okay then. Sick and tired of hearing the same old voices on the wireless? Are you looking for an alternative opinion to the mainstream media? Do you have a thing for a Scottish accent? If your answer is no to one or more of these questions, then you need the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Listen, watch, and share the fastest growing political program in the world! Here's the clip I was talking about. Take a look. Somebody actually came here in Oxford and said we need to educate the Iraqis. The Iraqis were teaching algebra when we were painting our faces blue and living in the forest. <laughs> you think you need to educate the Iraqis? Really? Really? Wait till you see the rest of that and you'll get my point when you do. Now, comic potential is not in short supply in international politics today. There's a comedian literally in charge of the Ukraine. We have a comedian, the Prime Minister of Britain, until tomorrow. Joe Biden's comic potential is literally unfathomable in the depths to which it could sink. Donald Trump, not much less so. So you'd think the field was wide open for one of the most brilliant comedians in America, except for the fact he is the most censored comedian in America. But that ought to make you sit up and take notice because the book they try to ban always goes to the top of the bestseller list. And when he appears in the East End of London, in October, on the 12th of October, the very night that we begin, the midweek mother of all talk shows, 
I reckon it will be standing room only. I hope so because I'm going to open the show for the one and only writer, comedian, comic genius that is Lee Camp. Lee, welcome once again uh, to the show. We'll uh, come back to the London appearance. I'll be asking what that's all about. But I'm right, Amantai. There must never have been a better time to be writing about comedy and politics. Good to be on here, Mr. Galloway. Good to see you. Uh, you are phenomenal yourself, so thank you for all the kind words. Uh, it's great to hear from you. But yes, this is an amazing time to be able to do comedy about politics. But the sad thing is, you have all these comedians, <clears throat> you know, and I'll speak for the United States, although you have plenty of wonderful ones in the UK as well. You have all these comedians, and they're on the front of every television show. They run every late night show, and they cannot even begin to truly question the core of the establishment. They'll go after this politician or that politician, but they'll never get at the heart of it. They'll never truly call America or the American empire out for our war crimes. And so <clears throat> you have all these comedians that worship at you know, the, the, the throne of George Carlin or Bill Hicks, but they don't actually do what Carlin or Hicks did, which was question the U.S. empire. They just are the comedians we have today. And some of them actually are Brits who come to the United States and get uh, late night shows. And they will not question the actual core, the actual heart of the U.S. empire. Well, we're very glad to have gotten rid of them, I must tell you, uh, better out than in. <laughs> Uh, is the view of most of us. And you're quite wrong if you think we've got lots of great comedians here in Britain. We don't. Uh, the comedians here are part of uh, the liberal establishment. That means you agree with them on lots of things if you are politically progressive. But they refuse to go to the heart of the matter, just as you describe they refuse to do so in the United States. So they end up, uh, I'll give you an example, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who had a lot of uh, weaknesses in his game and, uh, and uh, was no real fundamental threat to the ruling elite in the country, but he was enough of a danger to them uh, that the message went out that everyone should punch down on Jeremy Corbyn and the comedian class all did it almost to a man and woman. Uh, have I got news for you? Uh, mock the weak. Uh, all these right on lefty comedians that would have worshipped the likes of Carlin and Hicks in the end did the dirty on the only possible alternative there was that might have got to the heart of the matter. That's the problem we've got, isn't it? Yeah, and the exact same thing happened in the United States with, uh, with Bernie Sanders, also with Jill Stein, who ran uh, in the Green Party 2012 and 2016. And, you know, that is actually topical right now because Jill Stein and the Green Party were the ones talking about canceling student debt. It was one of their big platform planks, and they were made fun of. They were mocked. The idea of canceling student debt was just ridiculous. And one of the most known comedians to do segments on how insane Jill Stein and the Green Party were was none other than John Oliver in the United States from your fine country. But, uh, but uh, you know, now here we are. Joe Biden is talking about canceling a portion. Of course, he would never do the actual deed of canceling student debt, but canceling a portion of student debt, exactly as Green Party and Jill Stein had said. So these clowns run around just, you're right, punching down, punching at the third party, punching at the people who are outside of the main two party, which is really one party corporate elite. And, uh, and, and you know, here we are with that 
being the ideas that the Democrats pick up on, but then the Democrats water them down and dilute them so that they're not threatening the corporate America. The same thing was done with universal health care in the United States, which was a Green Party idea, and uh, the Green New Deal, which was a Green Party idea in the United States. And then it was picked up by the Democrats, called the Green New Deal, but watered down. All of the military commentary was taken out of it. Uh, and, and basically, the Democrats want to own it as their idea, but take out anything that's threatening to the, the true vampire parasites that actually run the show. Vampire parasites is a phrase that will live. Now, tell us about the censorship to which I alluded earlier. How far has it gone and what can we do about it, Lee? Yeah, I mean, the so there was the outright real extreme censorship, in your face censorship that happened to me and everyone at RT America, uh, you know, a, a few months ago, having uh, RT America shut down due to US sanctions. I know that uh, RT UK was also shut down by sanctions in your country. Um, and But then on top of that, YouTube took the added step of banning globally uh, my entire channel, 250,000 subscribers, thousands of videos, all banned globally, can never be viewed again. Uh, you know, it's the digital equivalent of burning books. And on the, in that same week, my podcast, one of my podcasts was removed from Spotify. And, and then on top of that is the ongoing censorship that I've faced since really 2016, since Bernie Sanders uh, came very close to winning the Democratic nomination. And since that time, my Facebook page and all my other platforms <clears throat> have been incredibly suppressed uh, shadow banned, really. I calculated it just two days ago, and my Facebook page, despite having 330,000 followers, a post was shown to 0.0005%. It is basically shown to no one. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's the digital equivalent of you spend 10 years building up a restaurant in a neighborhood, and then the city comes and puts a wall in front of it and says, well, the sidewalk is public territory, so we're putting a wall here and blocking it off. Sorry if that hurts your business a little bit. Uh, it, it just destroys the ability to reach people. So yeah, in many ways, I am the most censored comedian in America. Meanwhile, you can be racist or, or you know, uh, homophobic or all of those things and be some of the most known comedians in America, have giant Netflix specials, uh, all this garbage. So, you know, the idea that those are the censored comedians. Those comedians are tired of being canceled, et cetera, while they have the biggest platforms in the world. No, it's when you go after uh, the, the corporate rulers, the empire. It's when you go after the war criminals uh, like Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Obama, Bush, all are. When you do that, that's when you really become too threatening to be allowed on these, even on the digital platforms, not to mention the television platforms. And so you're, you're having to go back to olden times, aren't you? You're having to tramp the boards in theatres. But I suppose even there, there is danger of, uh, of venues uh, cancelling and so on. Yeah, actually, this was the first time I've really experienced this. Uh, we had multiple venues say they couldn't work with us because uh, we have, have called to attention the actual truth behind the proxy war in Ukraine, the reality of it, uh, you know, and, and that is the first time I've seen that at, at live comedy venues, because these live comedy venues will host some of the most, you know, disgusting, repulsive comedians out there, but apparently they won't work with someone who actually speaks the facts uh, about the proxy war in Ukraine. So uh, yeah, I, I hadn't dealt with that before particularly, um, but it, you know, th this isn't new, this has been done before, but I guess it hasn't been done as much recently. But you know, Lenny Bruce was one of our most famous stand-up comedians in the United States, but when he came out against religion and against uh, the, the government, then the cops started arresting him for his stage shows. They would sit in the audience and arrest him. They then started uh, arresting bar owners for having him on stage. And he ultimately OD'd on drugs, but really he was driven to his death. It's, it's kind of a, a you know, murder without the murder charge uh, scenario. And, and they really succeeded in, in destroying him. And that was back in the you know, 60s. So uh, this has happened before in the United States, despite us supposedly being the land of the free and free speech. 
Uh, we are anything but. We are the largest prison state in the world, and we claim to be the land of the free. So that tells you something. It's, uh, it's a new McCarthyism, but it is worse than McCarthy. Uh, McCarthy affected uh, civil servants. He affected uh, Hollywood uh, to uh, quite a significant extent, but not the uh, whole of the population. This new McCarthyism is, look, it's hard luck for thee and me, very hard luck in both of our cases. But it's worse than that. It means that there's a whole public out there, apart from the 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.25 that are being allowed to read your stuff, uh, is kept ignorant of even the existence of the other side of the story. That's the real danger of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's keeping people ill-informed and uninformed, and that's really the goal of it. Uh, you know, they, they are fine with debate. People like to say, well, what do you mean that something's uh, an opinion, not even opinions, <laughs> what do you mean a, a point of view is... Uh, is censored. I, I turn on the TV and I see them debating every day, two sides. It's like, those aren't the real two sides. Those two sides are within a tiny Overton window, a tiny window of allowable thought for your corporate rulers that really own this system. And, you know, you could see people debating, but it's not a real debate. It's a debate between bombing Syria next week and bombing them this week. That's not a real debate. The real debate is why are we at war? Why are, why are we run by a country run by war criminals? Those type of debates are the real debate, but that is carefully purged from your public airwaves and it keeps people really desperately ill-informed. And you know that's why I'm so excited to, to do these live shows and so excited that we'll get to have you on the show uh, October 12th. Yeah, I, I was going to turn to that now. London is getting ready to welcome you. Uh, tell us about that show, uh, but also the extent to which you think that uh, formerly two countries divided by a common language, uh, we are actually becoming, whether we like it or not, uh, one country, one Anglosphere. Our politics are almost the same. Our political and economic problems are almost the same. And our culture is beginning to merge also, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's sickening to see. I think that part of this proxy war that the U.S. has carefully crafted in Ukraine, you know, I'm, I'm opposed to the Russian invasion at the same time as I am adult enough to understand what pushed them to that point. Uh, and the reason, the, part of the reason, there are several, but part of the reason the U.S. wanted this proxy war was it forces much of Europe back into the feudal and the U.K., back into the feudal state position that they were starting to get out of. They were starting to make deals with Russia, deals with China. And this really helped push them back into that feudal state position underneath the United States. Uh, but like you're saying, we're, we're also seeing kind of the corporate takeover of culture uh, creating a very homogenous landscape, uh, you know, and, and not just with countries, but uh, across the U.S. I've toured most of the United States and most cities look essentially the same. The, the, the corporations that own the downtown are the same. Uh, they, they look very much the same. And that it's incredibly sad to see that these cities that used to have the vibrant difference style of life has all been homogenized and crushed by a, a corporate takeover. And I'm sure that's what you're speaking about is happening in Britain as well. Uh, so it, it really is uh, sad to see. Tell us then in the minute we've got left, uh, where do people get tickets for the London gig? Uh, yeah, it's so leecamp.com is the best place to go. Uh, just click on the schedule tab and it'll have the tickets there. And it'll be a combination of your, your awesome opening, which I'm excited for, uh, stand up comedy with me and Graham Elwood. And then we do a live podcast of it's called Government Secrets. It's all about the dirty history of the UK and the US that people have ignored or forgotten. And your mainstream media will never tell you about, but all out there in the open to read about if you wanted to take the time, if people wanted to take the time. And uh, so it's called Government Secrets. So we'll do a live taping of that podcast as well, October 12th in London, leecamp.com. 
Look forward to it, Lee. Look forward to it, leecamp.com. That will not be redacted. We will be there and speaking our truth. Now, Tea House, which is a Chinese outfit, uh, I don't know that much about them. I think, I'm guessing, that they are connected to Chinese uh, state media, but they, they plough a kind of independent furrow. And twice now, they have lifted my short address at the Oxford Union. Somebody said to me at the football yesterday, uh, today, uh, that they had uh, been watching my uh, performance at the Oxford Union. I asked which one. He didn't know that I have been debating at the Oxford Union for decades, uh, and some of them more memorable than others. This one now has millions of views, thanks to Tea House and China. Take a look. We're not making this proposition this evening because we're pacifists. Neither are we in any sense second to the honorable gentleman opposite in our determination to see the defeat of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Neither are we in second place to defend our people and our homeland against terrorism, which is, of course, a separate matter on which we, across the House, are in agreement. If Al-Qaeda and ISIS come here, we must shoot them dead. And if I'm the mayor of London, I'll be out with our well-armed police force helping them shoot them dead. This is an entirely red herring, a straw man introduced into this debate in order to confuse. I want to see every member of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all the other organizations like them dead on the battlefield. The difference here is our contention that the words Western intervention and ISIS really oughtn't to appear in the same sentence. Because, of course, the West are responsible for ISIS. It was the West who created ISIS, both directly and indirectly. Don't shake your head. Even Tony Blair accepts that. President Obama made the case very clearly just a month or two ago. ISIS, he said, grew out of our invasion and occupation of Iraq. It's an example, he said, of how we should aim before we shoot. And he was right about that. But what is less well known, I'm giving the information. <laughs> what is less well known? What is less well known is that this game started very much longer ago than that. How did the Taliban and Al Qaeda come to be? They came to be because the British and American governments, principally, using the money of the same satrapies in the Persian Gulf who are paying for the war in Syria now, built up this monster of Islamist fanaticism and extremism. Don't believe me? Watch Rambo 5. Watch Rambo 5 and see the dedication at the end of the movie to the freedom fighters of Afghanistan who were, of course, to become Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. It goes back even further than that, but I've only got eight minutes, and it takes me eight minutes to get my name and address out, generally. So I'll make my point that our culpability in the creation of ISIS is unanswerable, even from the mouths of those who are principally responsible for it. We're responsible for it. I'm giving the information, son. The 
responsibility is both direct and indirect. We didn't just invade and break and destroy and, and scatter to the four winds all the pieces of Iraq that have not yet, may never be put back together again. The reason we've got ISIS in Syria is because the same United States and Britain have been pouring money, material, weapons, political and diplomatic and propaganda support for the rebels. And every gun, every piece of material that we delivered to the battlefield in Syria ended up in the hands of either ISIS or Al-Qaeda or one of these other groups. That too is not contestable. Yes, sir. Um, just because we may have a historical responsibility for the actions, the creation of ISIS, does not mean that we have not learned from our mistakes. Oh, trust me, trust me, brother. Anybody listening to this debate is only too well aware that you haven't learned from your mistakes. I'm listening to the same kind of Orientalist claptrap that I could have heard at any time in the last few decades. We had a young woman up here saying we needed to educate. If I may finish my point. No, your point's finished. We, somebody actually came here in Oxford and said we need to educate the Iraqis. The Iraqis were teaching algebra when we were painting our faces blue and living in the forest. You think you need to educate the Iraqis? Really? Really? What are you going to educate them in? Military skills? We're not so good at that anymore. The Queen doesn't have enough soldiers. We ran away from Basra under fire, whipped. The United States withdrew from Iraq, beaten by the resistance of the Iraqi people. We're running out of Afghanistan and we'll be very lucky if it's only the Taliban that come back to power. Because competing against the Taliban is ISIS. The Taliban are the moderates in the fight that's about to ensue. So the West is a military failure with all respect to the honorable and gallant officers here present this evening. And where's all this money coming from? Where's all the soldiers coming? How many of you are going to put a tin hat on and go and fight in Syria? Not many, I'll warrant. But where's the money coming from? We can't keep our old age pensioners warm in the winter time. But you want to go around the world setting fire to other people's countries over and over again. And even go back to the same countries and set fire to them again. I never heard such ridiculous nonsense. Let's deal with our own problems. Let's deal with the problems of our own people. If ISIS come here, we'll kill them. And by the way, the Iraqi army have liberated Takrit, have liberated Ramadi, will liberate Mosul. Let's give them every support, no doubt, but they don't need Tommy Atkins and his gun to appear there and do it from, for them. And I've got news for you. The Syrian Arab army, a mainly Sunni army, is winning the war in Syria. It'll soon be over. ISIS and Al-Qaeda will soon be defeated. And the last thing they bloody well need is you lot turning up. <laughs>Well, that's the elite of uh, British society. That was so many years ago that some of them are probably in the British cabinet that will be announced this week. Others in the captaincy of industry and finance and maybe one or two in the military, notwithstanding my jibe about the tin hats. But I was right, was I not? And is that message not as evergreen today as it was back then? The only thing that's different is I'm two and a half stone lighter and don't I look better for it. Here's some super chats to read. Rudolf Gaspointer gives 10 euros. Thank you, Rudolf. 
Uh, he says, thanks, George, I would rather send you money than buy silly newspapers. Rudolph, nobody buys newspapers anymore, my friend. David Akero sends 200 Kenyan shillings. God bless Kenya. Uh, where can I purchase the Boris Johnson satnav, he says. And Liam Barrett gives 10 euros, just a small donation, not small at all, Liam, to the fighting fund from Liam in Dublin. And up the United, 3-1. United are back, four wins in a row. And boy, does Anthony look like the real deal. Uh, you don't need to comment, uh, of course. You can still donate without leaving a comment, as has Mario Menes, uh, Mexican Pesos 49. Thank you kindly. Don't think we've ever had a donation from Mexico before. Assad uh, gives one pound. Uh, Ian Robert Horton gives three pounds. Mr. Lover gives five dollars. Teresa Kelly, my old friend in the U.S., as she does every single week, sends ten American dollars. Ethan Lee sends 38 Hong Kong dollars. Despite the charge that I'm a Chinese asset, I have no idea how much money that is, but it's very welcome indeed. And Jason Kane gives one pound. Let's go to the lines. G in Leeds on the cost of living crisis. G, welcome to the show. Uh, good evening, uh, George Galloway. I must say, uh, I liked your speech about Iraq. I think uh, that was, you've done your homework and uh, that was good to hear your speech about Iraq and uh, it was Thank good you. to hear all that information. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but but regarding there, cost of living, yeah, regarding the cost of living, yeah. well, I would like to say the cost of living never went up when the Gulf War 1 and 2 was going on. It never went up when the Iraq War was going up. On. It never went uh, up, uh, the cost of living never went up when the Afghanistan war was going on. I think it's just a smoke screen. And also, another information is how could a, a wholesale energy prices go up then the energy company make so much colossal profit? Someone's lying here. Just add, add it all together. And I think it's corporations are lying. So you think I'm cooperating in the line? No, I'm not saying you, I'm saying the corporations, what, the energy companies, they're lying about the war in Iraq, the whole prices are going up. They must put, put, put it on the index figure. They can make it up themselves, saying that a whole price prices gone up, just, just to convince us that the price has gone up. Where, where, where they put the price up themselves, so they can make these profits to get more money out of us. Well, I'll tell you what, G, let's make a date, you and me. If you call me, towards the end of December, just before Christmas, will review the quality of your argument that this is all just a smokescreen. You're right to this extent. There is no need in Britain for this energy crisis. We require or depend on just 3% of Russian oil and gas. That means 97% not Russian oil and gas. We are a significant oil and gas producer ourselves. Energy companies are making a killing. The government are doing nothing about that killing. But it's still going to keep on killing, gee. That ain't a smokescreen. That's fire, real fire. Tom is in London. Let's hear from Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, g'day, George. I just want to remind your listeners about an event that the Don't Extradite Assange campaign is holding on the 8th of October, um, surround Parliament Square, link arms, uh, not surround Parliament Square, surround Parliament and link arms, uh, let everybody know that there's a massive support for Assange out there. And give the date and time again, Tom. Okay, 1 p.m., 8th of October. Look at the DEA website, don't extradite Assange, or one word, um, and register that you will be there. 
be there, be in Parliament Square. Thanks, Tom, for that. Uh, George is in America in a place called Akron on U.S. Wars. George, what would you like to say? Well, I'd just like to say, George, that uh, Kelly Mora and I really admire your stances on things. And I served as a medical corpsman in Vietnam, and I never thought that we would again commit such a mindless, useless debacle as we are presently doing with the uh, Ukraine war. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite disturbed about it because I think we seem to be sleepwalking towards the abyss and uh, whistling towards the grave, so to speak, and the elites are just so divorced from the common people's concerns and worries that it, it doesn't it doesn't look good. I hate to be so pessimistic, sir. No, uh, but I absolutely hear what you're saying. For those of us, you and me, uh, who lived through the Vietnam War, you more closely than me, obviously, uh, it's difficult to understand how our rulers keep managing to march everyone to front after front after front, war after war after war. The same journalists and broadcasters that marched us into the disaster of the Iraq war, not 20 years ago yet, have marched us again effectively into the war in Ukraine. Um, it's really a question of, to paraphrase George W. Bush, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It's us that are the fools, George, because they keep getting away with it. Well, uh, I think one of your lustrous countrymen said it best, William Shakespeare in King Lear. He said that as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods. They kill us for their sport which is pretty much what Biden says well, you know, about it. Yes, uh, go ahead, sir. It's, uh, that's, exactly what, that's exactly what he said this week. It's exactly what uh, Boris Johnson said in his valedictory address, although neither, of course, had the eloquence of William Shakespeare. George, thanks uh, very much uh, for that uh, call. Now, as I told you last week, I think, uh, the mother of all talk shows is going on the road it's the mother of all roadshows, and it begins in Stockport. And uh, the sales, the ticket sales are going like hot cakes. There's the uh, details there. It's Monday the 7th of November. Now, let me tell you uh, one or two things about the theatre. Parking is free outside. If you're coming by train, it's only five minutes walk from Stockport train station. Stockport is just six miles from Manchester. It's a wonderful theatre. We got a great welcome there. Uh, my colleague Shen went to see them this week. Uh, he sent me some of the video. The theatre looks absolutely brilliant. I might actually book it every month and have a different kind of event uh, every month. But this one, the mother of all road shows, we're going to be filming at it. Gayatri is going to be filming at it, interviewing people, and we'll show those interviews, plus clips from the roadshow itself on the subsequent edition of Moats. So uh, there's only just over 50 tickets left. So you better get them quick. Better get them soon from Ticket Source. Uh, now, David in Nottingham is on the line. Let's hear from him. David, go ahead. Hi, George. Uh, what I'd like to say, George, is uh, I feel that there's a group of um, institutions, like very wealthy individuals who profit hugely from um, hostilities from one nation against another. Sure. And um, sure. it's like, and the, the governments that are around now, they're, well, they're all, in my opinion, they're all trade because they don't care about the country and all the people. They just line their own pockets. And it's a betrayal to the people and, and the country. And um, like, like the gas yeah, crisis. they're lining their own pockets, and they're lining the pockets of of, of, uh, of the WEF and the Davos Group and, the, and all the rest uh, of it. Yeah, yeah, 
They yeah. own the military industrial complex. They're friends. People they went to the Oxford Union with. So you believe, George, that um, the gas crisis has nothing to do with Ukraine war whatsoever. Uh, there, there was a peace deal on the table and Boris went over and scuffed that peace deal. He wouldn't let Zelensky sign up to it because um, he wanted to blame Ukraine Well, that's for... certainly widely... That's, yeah, that's widely reported and it's undoubtedly true, David, that uh, the power in the world did not want to see this war end. They wanted this war to begin. They supported it from the coup in 2014 until now, except now they're in fifth gear and they're emptying our coffers and emptying our ammunition stores and our armories also. We, we actually don't have the equipment and weapons that we need to defend our own country because we are shipping it to Ukraine, along Georgia. with now more than $80 billion, $80 billion in direct transfers to the Treasury in Kiev. Last word to you, David. George, do you feel that Russia is once again going to save the world from the Nazis? Uh, I don't put it in these Manichaean terms. Uh, I think that uh, Russia has defeated already, will defeat uh, the attempt by NATO uh, to create a military threat against Russia in its front porch. Uh, it has defeated that. I don't believe that the Russian army is going to keep on going. I don't believe it's going to reconquer the the Baltic states or Poland or Germany or any of that. But I hope it will prove a lesson that Russia and its new alliance with China are the new power in the world. And everyone needs to respect that and get alongside it. Seek to profit from it uh, in business, in culture, in tourism, in human relations. Seek to benefit from the rise and rise of Eurasia, instead of seeking to check its rise and, if possible, destroy its rise, because neither of those things is going to happen. Right after this short break, it's the one and only Farron Fronchek. She's fair and balanced, just like me. Stay tuned. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland, and I love the Scottish food. It's great food. I said to Melania, you know, haggis, look at that. What's more than, more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, look, wherever you're watching the show, hit the like button, won't you? I'm told it makes a difference to the algorithms if you get my drift. Now, we've interviewed one of my former colleagues because I used to work on RT America, as was, now defunct. And now we're about to interview another of my colleagues. They thought that they had silenced both Lee Camp and Farhan Fronchek, but my goodness, they misunderestimated them. Farhan, welcome back. You're still firing on all cylinders. I follow your output avidly. Um, we'll come towards the end of our talk uh, on how people can follow you, what you're doing now. Uh, but I was exploring with Lee Camp uh, the comic potential of uh, international politics right now. And there's mm -hmm. no comedian funnier than Joe Biden, unless you have the misfortune to be living under his rule. Uh, but when I saw him this week clear the television schedules to 
I don't know if he'd had an injection or taken a pill uh, or what. <laughs> uh, but he he became he became Hitler up there on the on oh. the podium. I mean, not the content of his speech, but his hand waving, his histrionics, his uh, his voice. I mean, he was uh, he was high. <laughs> you know, George. I got to tell you, with a little bit of comedic background to me as well, just like Lee, I got to say, you just stole my joke. I was going to say, if you would have put a little silver stash on Joe Biden, coupled with the blood red backdrop, you would have proven every single conspiracy theorist right that Hitler, in fact, did go to South America and he came back to the U.S. for his final goodbye speech. I mean, it was over the top. And the best part of it all, uh, George, was that you have this backdrop of blood red, okay? Joe Biden is a Democrat, okay? Their color, if you don't know, is bright blue, like the color I'm wearing, okay? Uh, I don't know who his uh, set designers were. Uh, I don't, I'm, honestly, I'm gonna say this, George, I don't think it was a woman because we would not have passed up the chance to have a beautiful blue background. But you also had it too, where it was in front of Independence Hall, which for those over across the pond, that's in Philadelphia, the very first, capital of the United States, which I guarantee you most average, below average American doesn't realize that or know that. And it's also where the Constitution was drafted in 1789 at the Constitutional Convention, which also many average, below average Americans don't know that. So they thought they were making like this big deal, this big, big speech about democracy and being in front of the place where it all started. Totally went over everybody's head. All they heard was Trump bad, MAGA Republicans, uh, this is a, a, an assault on democracy, and frankly, what the Republicans are calling it, they're calling it a dog whistle for violence. Now, you again, let's go back to that blood red background that you know you saw kind of with any other dictator like Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, all giant bright red backgrounds in the, in, when they were giving their dic, like dictator speeches in, in history that we've seen. Um, the one funny part of it all was is CNN, for some reason, they had a weird pink background. And many people were saying, wait a minute, CNN has new ownership now. Uh, they want to be more of the unbiased, just straightforward news. How is it that everybody had a red background, but CNN had a pink background? Oh, they found out that they altered the hue of the picture to make it more pink and less blood red in your face. When they were actually asked about this, George, they said, oh, well, it was just because of the CBS feed that we were getting the picture from. Well, George, you and I, we're not idiots. We come from, we were in this industry. We know that when you get a feed from another network, it's not like it shows up blue for one, pink and purple for the other. It's all red. They were caught red-handed. This after they wanted to be the new fair and unbiased news. Hilarious. Maybe they, maybe they wanted to send an L, LGBTQ plus I whatever uh, message. Maybe that's what they were up to. Now, Hillary One way Clinton. To do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Hillary Clinton uh, coined that uh, disastrous phrase, uh, a basket of deplorables, uh, to describe the kind of people that were then shaping up. Uh, to vote for Donald Trump against her. She succeeded in putting far more of them in the basket than there had been in the first place. But Biden went much further than that. In his speech, he effectively declared half the country to be enemies of the state, didn't he? Well, and not only that, George, he said, and I quote, he said, uh, you know, as they see their, their MAGA failure to stop a peaceful transfer of power after the 2020 election as a preparation for the 2022 and 2024 elections, there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans, okay? Then he goes on the next day saying, well, I wasn't talking about all Republicans. I was just talking about the MAGA ones, the regular Republicans. They're not a threat. And you have to ask yourself again, like you said, Okay, well, define then the difference between a MAGA Republican and a regular Republican, because here's what happened, George. When you had the Trump Mar-a-Lago FBI raid, the, 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 the night of, the day after, every single Republican came forward and said, this is insane, this is, a, you know, this is, this is political, the FBI is political, what's happening here? Maybe it didn't go as far as to say it's a witch hunt, but what that says 
is Donald Trump is the head of the Republican Party when everyone has been trying to deny it, even so much so as Mitch McConnell, the minority Republican leader in the Senate. They realized that day of the raid, he is still the Republican leader. And for Joe Biden to put this in there, knowing that now, as everybody sees it, Donald Trump is the leader of the Republican Party. It is that classic back to 2016 basket of deplorables, but now they're even worse. They're tyrannical. They're led by a dictator fascist government under Donald Trump, and they want to overthrow every single election and bring everybody back to basically the Stone Age and start over. Uh, a lot of Americans weren't having it. Now, if you look at the Democratic side, they thought that the speech was just unifying, and there's no political, it's not political to talk about bringing back democracy. It's not political at all. So you really have two schools of thought here, which just goes to show that many of our politicians still remain useless and clueless. Well, the one thing we are not is a United Kingdom, and the one thing you are not is a United States. Uh, the yeah, polarization no. in politics in our country and yours uh, has never been more extreme, uh, it, certainly in our case, and I think in yours also. Uh, it's quite clear to me, just following the media coverage and on social media, the level of fear of another Donald Trump election victory amongst people that call themselves liberals, pussy hats, uh, the chatterati, the commentariat, and all, the level of fear is reaching extreme proportions. Some are saying, for example, should people under investigation for espionage, which of course Trump is not, but should people under investigation for espionage be allowed to hold massive public rallies. That tells you it was a massive public rally that he held. Mm -hmm. And they're terrified that he's coming back. Are they right to be? George, they, are, they have absolutely every single right to be terrified. And I'll tell you why. You go back to the U.S. Constitution. They were trying to make it out that there was this one little clause and one little, uh, you know, uh, uh, article in the Constitution that, you know, if somebody gets indicted for, you know, having, you know, it was like basically going against presidential duties that they could be removed from office. Guess what? The Constitution has three requirements for running for president. You have to be over the age of 35. You have to have lived in the United States for at least 14 years, and you have to be a U.S. citizen. That's it. We've had congressmen actually run from their prison cells in our history, okay? They're terrified because they know no matter what they do, even if he were to run from his jail cell, he could still do it if he wanted to, if he gets caught for espionage. And that's one of the biggest problems here, George, is you're seeing that, you know, we have 2022 midterms coming up here in, in less than two months, November. And you have where the Democrats are probably going to lose the House. And it's going to probably go back to the Republicans. The Senate, still somewhat of a toss up, but the House is what they're really looking at because Republicans have talked about, and mind you, the Democrats and the Republicans for this midterm cycle, they both are not running on anything except get get the other guy out of power. It's a very easy, just blatant, we're done with the other side, so vote for us. The laziest election you can imagine, okay? But one thing that Republicans have promised, though, is they want to hold Benghazi-style investigations into three major things. They want to look into Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings. They want to look at the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and how they say Joe Biden botched it. And then they also want to talk about the collapsed sale of Twitter to Elon Musk. So Democrats are really trying to stop this kind of wave as Republicans are saying, no, 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 no. They had the whole January 6 hearings. If you've seen, you know, uh, if you've been following U.S. politics at all, which honestly was kind of a big dud. A lot of Americans didn't really watch it because they're worried about how to put food on the table and pay for gas. Uh, so you have all these other Republicans saying, you know what? <laughs> S s strap in, folks. When we get the House back, oh, man, are we going to have a field day with Democrats? So, uh, again, as you said, not united as far as any United States goes. Uh, but it, like you said, it doesn't seem like we're the only ones. It seems like the UK, our brothers and sisters across no. the pond, you guys might be going through the same thing. 
Yeah, you're definitely not alone, and neither are we both alone. Uh, if you saw the 100,000 people yesterday in Wenceslas Square in Prague, mm -hmm. uh, the Bulgarian government has already fallen. The Albanian government might well fall. Uh, there are, uh, Macron lost his majority. Boris Johnson is out this evening. He's actually moving out of Downing Street as we speak with the removal van and all of his uh, movables. Uh, so um, it's not going too well for uh, the likes of Joe Biden. And you can't win elections just talking about the other guy when you mm -hmm. yourself are historically unpopular. Uh, Joe Biden has approval ratings uh, that uh, have scarcely, if ever, been worsened by any other president of the United States. And his deputy, Kamala Harris, is even less popular than him. So I think the writing's on the wall in November, Farhan. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you not only have that, George, but you also just have this whole dichotomy of the last election, you know, we had 2016, where it really kind of swung in, swung open the doors to more of a populist president, the way that Donald Trump ran. Then in 2020, it was basically, you know, a referendum on Donald Trump swinging back the other way. Now with Joe Biden's approval rating being around 34 percent, the lowest that we've seen in probably a century now, uh, you know, you're going to have that pendulum swing ultimately the exact opposite way. And you wonder why. Uh, or Americans wonder why, especially the elite class, because there really is no Democrat, Republican. They're all in the same party. It's us versus everybody else, the elite versus everybody else, us, the peasants. Um, but they're sitting there wondering, wh why is it that nobody, everyone's leaving the party? We have the most independent voters than the country has ever seen because they're seeing that the, the Democrats don't help you. The Republicans will say that they help you. But then kind of when push comes to shove, it's always all oh, the Democrats did, wouldn't let us do it. Uh, but Republicans have, have seen less of a decline than the Democrats. The Democrats have been the ones that have promised so much from free everything. They get into office. They have the House the Senate and the White House and nothing gets done. Uh, and, you know, and then but then the Democrats get all mad with with Senator Joe Manchin and Senator Kirsten Sinema, who held everything up. There's always an excuse for everything. And Amer the American people are starting to see that it's owned by big corporations, by the big tech, by big oil, by the military industrial complex. And people are changing it to independent. And the one thing that I will say that I'm very happy about with Americans, I even see on my show, you know, even folks that, from my show are coming over to your show and seeing more of what's going around on around the world and they're loving what they're seeing just from the chat that i can see uh they're saying wow not only are we not the only ones being lied to it seems like a lot of other people are getting lied to they don't care about us we're actually starting to really do deep dives into these candidates to where no you know you said this but then you were going around and doing that that's not going to work for me this time around. So voters are getting smarter. And, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in these midterms, George, because I think both sides of the aisle, their feet will be held to the fire in some way or another. Well, in the words of Michael Jackson, all I want to say is they don't care. They really they don't really care about us. I wish I hadn't fluffed that line. You're looking fabulous <laughs> in front of that pink wall. Uh, what, uh, how can people follow your, uh, your channel, what you're doing? Uh, uh, really quick, you said Michael Jackson. I'm going to give you one with George Carlin, my all-time favorite. I'm glad Lee brought him up before. Uh, it's a big club, and we ain't in it. That's, that's I think, the overarching one, too. Uh, but no, so I'm on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash uh, fair and balanced. It's F-A-R-A-N balanced. I'm also on locals, fair and balanced locals com where uh, it's uncensored. Uh, it's it's free to sign up. Uh, and there I, I go live every morning, uh, U.S. time and talk unfiltered, uh, straight from the heart, uh, a lot more of my opinions and how I feel. But then again, every night, U.S. time for my show, Fair and Balance, where we talk politics with a little bit of commentary and, of course, some comedy along with it. Fabulous, Farhan. Thanks very much indeed, as always, for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, Fuad sends 200 Egyptian pounds. Thank you, Fuad, most kind. Uh, and there have been loads of comments that have been coming in, but those are very particularly generous donation. 
from Liz Hill, who sent a hundred American dollars, and not for the first time. Thank you so much, George, for everything you do. Warmest greetings from Malcolm Byrne and me in the US to you, Gayatri, and your entire beautiful family. And back at you, Liz and Malcolm. Malcolm Byrne is a Pulitzer Prize winning radio host uh, who did a great, great show with me that Liz produced. And that's how we have become uh, friends. Thank you for your generous donation. Robert P. Uh, gave five, but I've just lost it uh, there. Uh, two boom. Yeah, Robert P. Five British pounds. The UK government uh, should be reminded that it has a duty and a responsibility to the UK people first. Putting the current Ukraine state before our people betrays this duty. Uh, now, we've had Mexican pesos, Kenyan shillings, and Indonesian rupiah. And it wasn't from my wife, I can assure you, uh, in donations tonight. This really is a global show. Let's go around the world with the latest donations. Khalid al Siraji, two Canadian dollars. M. Gem, seven Australian dollars, 99 cents. T. Mac, two British pounds. Malcolm Thimana, uh, 39 South African Rand. Tommy Putra, 20,000 Indonesian rupiah. That sounds like a lot, Tommy, thanks. Otto Calvo, 10 Norwegian krona. Thanks as always, Otto, a regular donor. And JV Manila, 215 Philippine pesos. Two boomers, 10 British pounds. Aussie in Minsk, uh, Minsk that is. Uh, Belarus, no shortages in any food, power or products and prices are low. The price of petrol and gas in Russia is 40 times less uh, than it currently is in the European Union. Let's take a quick break. Uh, then I want to tell you about my public appearance in Brighton. Be right back. From the makers of Where's the WMD? Who killed Epstein and pinned the blame on the Democratic donkey? Comes the brand new game, Where's Biden Hiding? Play the tapes. Figure out what the hell he's trying to say. It is me, Joe Biden. Try and find Where's Biden Hiding? Where's Biden Hiding? We can't find him. This product is fictional and is not available in your local burn down store. But seriously, if anyone finds him, please let us know. Big thanks, obviously, to all our subscribers and listeners to the Moats podcast. For the older amongst you, a podcast is the distilled version, uh, about half as long, uh, which has become a phenomenon. Uh, on the internet and also my Wednesday show the Galloway show which I hope you'll tune into on my YouTube channel exclusively on YouTube on Wednesday at seven o'clock that's also got a podcast which has also gone off like a rocket so it's a media phenomenon and it's tearing up the mainstream uh, media monopoly please uh, download it on Apple or Spotify and leave us a five-star review like Sanam in London who said, George, I've been watching your show uh, for a long time and I must admit that you are a true leader and very courageous man to carry on your work of exposing the truth and showing us the other side of the picture, which always gets blocked by the US and the West through their media. God bless you always. Sanam in London. Very touching, Sanam. Thank you very much uh, for that. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now remember, you can get the essence of the mother of all talk shows, Sean of All Trimmings, in our podcast, which we relaunched just a few weeks ago and is now available and being downloaded in nearly 150 countries around the world. Truly a global phenomenon. I think we've got a, a, a little uh, 
poster for it that tells you how to do it. It, uh, yeah, it's available on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. There's even a QR code there. You can just wave your phone in front of it and you can download it uh, if you want the shorter, essential version of the mother of all talk shows. Do it that way. Uh, now, on Friday, uh, I'll be on the streets of Birmingham in Sparkbrook and, and uh, Balsall Heath. And if you're in the Birmingham area, you want to catch up with me, please do. I'll be electioneering for Dr. Phil Bevan, our candidate in the council by-election there. It's the first cost of living by-election uh, that I think we can say has been fought. And we are fighting for every single vote there. So every week and in the last week, every day, I'll be there in Birmingham on the streets of the Hall Green constituency. Uh, and I'll be at the TUC on, I think it's the, the 7th, is it, Gayatri? We've got the, no, it's the 12th, Monday the 12th. So that's a week on Monday at 7 p.m. Now, you don't need to be a delegate to the TUC Congress to attend the meeting. Anyone is welcome to attend, but you need to tell us that you are coming. You need to register that you are coming. Uh, and two of my good colleagues from the RMT, the Rail Workers Union, and the ASLEF, the Rail, the Train Drivers Union, will be speaking alongside me, and maybe a surprise guest also. So uh, if, you want, if you're in the Brighton area, next Monday, the 12th of September at 7 p.m. I'm not sure it shows the venue, but you'll get that when you register. Uh, let's go to the lines and hear from the redoubtable Richard in Manchester. Go ahead, Richard. Oh, thank you very much indeed for having me on your show, George. I've, I've been watching it avidly, as you know, for okay. years. And I've been over to your shows yeah. where you've uh, done the killing of Kelly and uh, the killings of Tony Blair and so on. Okay. And uh, those, uh, those CDs yeah. are absolutely priceless George they don't cost a lot of money and everybody throughout the world should at least have one of them if not two because I'm just leading on to what I, I think has happened over the last 30 years um, my father would have been turning in his grave and uh, when Blair came to power and he met the Clintons and then all sorts of evil was set loose we've been warring with people for nothing for year after year after year after year and it is still going on when Blair came to power, what did he yeah. do? He smashed the unions, or Thatcher did, but he carried it on and said, oh, no, there'll be no more. It's going to be new Labour, but really we're going to be the old Labour. And he told a lie on that. I voted for him three times, I'm ashamed to say, because I saw just where he was actually going. But a lot of people didn't read those things. You do, because you were in his government. You were one who stuck up to him. You were one who were ostracized and you were one who was sacked and you were one who had to put up with a lot of nonsense from him. And um, my hat goes off to you. And when I see you in the Senate and I play that tape, uh, they tried to get you under false pretenses. I look at it and I go, George Galloway is a man who stood up for the rights of the people in this country and I would say that to anybody and I do say it to people and I say to them watch the moats watch it and listen and see some of the great people that George has on and when I go and when I've seen your shows it's been absolutely fantastic when when Trump came thank to, you Richard when Trump came to power George if I may go on I, I prophesied that there yeah. would be no wars and, and there wasn't. And then um, um, everybody uh, said uh, uh, when, uh, oh, sorry, my memory's going a little bit. Um, when, when our prime minister, who had just been debunked, I thought, this is not bad for the country, even though I'm a labor man. And I said, if we could get a trillion dollar, two trillion, three trillion dollars um, uh, of a, um, a deal, between a trade deal between us and America, it would do 
your children, my grandchildren, your grandchildren, and everything else, it would do us the world of good. But that didn't happen because he, he was cheated out of that second um, election. And I say that, I think, because I've followed it very, 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 very deeply. And I hope that they can um, come back again, that he will come back, and that they will trade if it's Liz Truss. And I hope that she will do the right thing and back the poor people and give them... Uh, uh, money uh, to pay for this next two or three years uh, um, real uh, trying situation that they're in because we are a great nation and if we can all stick together we'll get by and we will beat the ones who want to beat us the people who want to stay in the EU that must be beaten 17.4 million people they should all rise up and all come on whatever media and tell other people we don't want to go back in the EU. Thank you, George, for letting me speak. Well, tonight. there might not be. Thank you. God bless you for all of that, Richard. I wish I had time to respond to many of the great points that you made. Uh, but there probably will not be a European Union, at least not as we knew it uh, at the end of this current uh, wave of crises and maybe we'll deal with that uh, on another uh, occasion. The final poll results are in. I can't myself see them but they are uh, apparently extraordinary. Will there be blackouts in the coming big freeze? On Twitter, yes, 69%, no, 31%. On YouTube, Yes, 83%, no, 17%. And on Telegram, yes, 89%, no, 11%. Many thousands of you have voted. I'm grateful uh, for it. And that is the final result uh, on the poll. Uh, let's go to Lawrence in London. Go ahead, Lawrence. Hello, George. Nice to talk to you. Um, a couple of short points, really, just on the energy thing. Now, the first one mm. is regarding geothermal energy capture. It's probably one of the most environmentally favorable cyclical energy forms. We've already got piping that can now last around 50 to 100 years, and the heat exchange, boilers, convectors, what you want to call them, between 30 to 50 years. Now, with plenty of room for improvements in both, as well as the heat exchange fluid, why do you think we're not spending more money on this energy extraction form? And my other point, really, well, I'll, um, I'll, and you might be able yeah, to fill on. this out, is regarding energy costs, the costs of gas, Russian gas. The last I heard regarding this was that we used to get our gas on long-term contracts. And the Russians wanted to stick to those long-term contracts. But the powers that be thought they could get one over the Russians by using spot price for the contracts. And the Russians said, please don't do this. Stick with long-term contracts. Um, but they went ahead and did it. Um, and shortly after that, the spot price went from around £40, £50 per therm, up to what we have, I think, yesterday, £500 a therm. Um, it's over £500. Do you know more pounds. about that? Uh, well, I do know that the sanctions have turned into a gigantic boomerang, and moreover, a razor sharp gigantic uh, boomerang and the failure to uh, to uh, stick to the contracts that we had uh, with Russian uh, energy uh, suppliers who as you rightly say were absolutely committed to continue. Russia has been a stable and reliable partner in the supply of oil and gas for half a century and since the fall of the Soviet Union, the, uh, there has never been any attempt by Russia to politically exploit uh, its customers. It was ready forevermore to continue supplying us 
at the cheap and reliable price we were paying. It's us that announced sanctions on them. And therefore, Boris Johnson and others trying to blame Russia for this catastrophe into which this tornado into which we are now entering, you'd have to be an idiot to believe it, that it's somehow Russia's fault, that you put sanctions on them. Having spent the last eight years fueling war in Ukraine on their borders. Lawrence, I can't deal with the uh, other uh, energy point that you made just because of the hour, and I have other things to turn to, but we will look at the energy field, if you like, including uh, geothermals, in subsequent shows, because this issue isn't going to go away. I need to acknowledge Tony Bond, who gives £10 and says, keep up the great work. As a small retail business, it's an unbelievable uphill struggle. Not only the costs, but people have nothing to spend. Tony, that's the double whammy. Not only does your shop, your small business, your cafe, your restaurant, not only is it now facing steadily, and I think quite quickly, unpayable gas and electricity prices that will put you out of business, even if it didn't put you out of business, the people it has thrown onto the unemployment scrap heap no longer have money to spend in your small business. And what will be left? A lot of derelict shop fronts, a lot of derelict pubs, a lot of derelict small hotels, derelict businesses. The big business, monopoly capitalism, will come along and hoover up at a, for a song at a kind of uh, fire sale prices. And there will have been a fire sale because nobody could put the fire on because of the cost. And uh, Jiggermas gives five pounds and says regarding the opening of a coal mine and still no decision has been made. I'm well aware uh, of this. If they don't open that coal mine now in the, in the situation we're in, then Ward 5 at Broadmoor really has taken over the government. Mick A gives five pounds. Moats, keep the heat up with facts, not fiction. Thank you, Mick. And Mind Block gives ten pounds, saying keep up the good work, George. As long as God gives me breath, I will. John Kelly gives ten pounds. Get Nord Stream 2 online. That's there. Could easily have been now supplying cheap, reliable Russian gas. It's us that caused its closure. Jolly Rogers, $10. Nero Biden, looking like a green goblin against a blood-red backdrop. Jolly Rogers, that is a very vivid picture you just painted there and perfectly accurate. Akwati gives $20. The independence of the Biafra Republic and the unconditional release of MNK, a British citizen from the Nigerian jail. Can't go with you down that track, I'm afraid. I'm against countries breaking up in Africa and elsewhere. J.H. Scott 6 gives $2. Keep up the good work and thanks for speaking out. Nikola Bibarovic gives £2. Thank you, Nikola. Bella, $10. Helen Sutcliffe, five pounds. This is the first time I've disagreed with you, George, but the wall behind Farah is clearly lilac not pink. I hope we won't fall out over this. Was it really? It looked pink to me. It must be my age. My wife's telling me, yes, it was lilac. Charles in Hertfordshire is next. Go ahead, Charles, quickly. Good evening, Judge, and thank you for uh, taking my call. Uh, basically, um, I think it's a phrase that came up while I was trying to think about what I was going to talk about, and it's, it's, it says, code red for democracy, you know? Uh, basically, the reason why I'm thinking about this is because uh, I still remember, I, I still have vivid images of the poll tax and how people basically, when um, 
odious uh, policies are being uh, forced on them, they come together out in mass, you know, and it grows into um, this conflation of fire. You've also got, uh, uh, I think uh, what's happening, uh, all I'm picking up on the internet is uh, basically uh, with the coming uh, price cap being lifted, you know, you've got a lot of people who are saying can't pay, won't pay, i.e. they're basically tr uh, saying that they're not going to pay their, um, their, um, uh, their bills, you know. And on the face of it, all you see is just a collection of people getting together, you know. But if you look upon it from a wider point of view, like say, for example, what's happening in, in Europe, where the, is, it, is it in the Czech Republic? where you've got a lot of people who are actually coming together and saying that, uh, you know, and they're protesting against the government, you know. These things start off as like just people getting together uh, to a common cause. But um, as in the, with the Occupy... Um, well, I hope so. Uh, look, Charles, I need to cut you short because the hour is uh, up, in fact. But the, uh, the need... Look, I don't like disorder. I want uh, peaceful... Uh, opposition to the government's failure to control the energy companies and the energy price. I was at the uh, poll tax riot uh, in Trafalgar Square, but only because I was standing on Nelson's column giving a speech. And with my young daughter, and I, then young daughter, now mother of five, and I was uh, extremely frightened for her safety uh, because the situation, as you may recall, uh, very quickly got out of hand and uh, a great deal of violence and disorder was the result. I don't want that. I want so many millions of people to refuse to pay their bills and to come out on peaceful demonstrations all over the country to demand action from the government, to bring the energy companies under public ownership and control, at least control, if not ownership, at least control. We must control the price or our people will die, our economy will sink, and we can't allow that. And if the politicians will not do it unshoved, we need to shove them. The last call is from Sharon in Fife. Go ahead, Sharon. Hi there, George. How are you? All good, by the grace of God. Thank you. Good, good. Um, so, the, obviously, the government is, is not in a good place. There's no faith in any parties at the moment, whether Conservative or Labour. But if you were in power, if you were Prime Minister, what would be your top three things that you would do first? Well, I've, I've literally got no seconds to answer that, Sharon, uh, but it would be this. Uh, you see, I've now gone past nine o'clock, which means I need to pay people to continue working when I only hired them for two hours. So let me be very quick and hope they don't charge me for the full hour. I would end British participation in the economic war against Russia. I would take gas and electricity back into public ownership. Now I say back into because this is not some radical, fanciful idea of mine. It's what used to be. We used to own the gas. We used to own the electricity. And we owned the railways and we owned the, uh, the water and we owned all these utilities because they are essential to life. Without them, we cannot live. And therefore, they cannot be left to the invisible hand, to the hard heart of what they call the market. A market which is in any case rigged. So there's two things, Sharon. I don't have time for a third. You'll need to come back on Wednesday at 10 p.m. UK time for the Galloway Show, only on YouTube. And on the mother of all talk shows next Sunday on all platforms for now at 7 p.m. UK time. Thank you for all your donations. Remember, you can go to our website, moats.tv, and donate there. Good night.